The views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, December 4th, 2020. Today's episode is about urban women have higher risks of chronic diseases than rural dwellers and leave race out of kidney function estimates. Removing race modifier would yield more CKD diagnosis among black patients. So, you know what I want you to do? That's right all the way from the United States to Australia. Get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners late at night. You know I appreciate you. Grab your favorite glass of wine and say hello to my niece, Honey. I call her Honey. And come on and join the conversation right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. We all know the benefits of apple cider vinegar. Now, you guys know that I'm a vegan and that I have lupus along with other health issues. I used to take ACV every morning before I worked out, but eventually the taste of ACV got to me and I had to look for another alternative. And that's when a friend of mine turned me on to Goli. Goli is the first apple cider vinegar gummy. They give you all the benefits of ACV without the taste. That's right. Goli is vegan, gelatin free, gluten free, and 100% organic. And the vitamins and the ACV in Goli promotes a healthy heart by maintaining a healthy cholesterol range, controls blood sugar levels, and also curbs your appetite. And the best part about Goli, for every sale generated, A child in need receives a six-month supply of essential vitamins with vitamin angels. So, if you don't believe what I'm saying, I'm going to give you some information so you can try Goli for yourself. Here's a promo code you can use. It's Sue Lynn 1. That's S-U-E-L-Y-N-N-E-1. And you'll receive 5% off of 
of your initial purchase. Also, I'll leave a link in the description in the podcast. So, why don't you go and try it for yourself? You won't believe how good it tastes. That's goalie. Let's get started talking about urban women have higher risk of chronic diseases than rural dwellers. I found this article in Medical News Life Sciences. African women who live in cities are 7% more likely to have chronic diseases than rural dwellers. Africa's booming urban population is increasingly vulnerable to chronic diseases with women at greater risk of obesity-related illnesses. A study of cities and health has found. The United Nations estimates that 68% of the world's population will live in urban areas by 2050, with almost 90% of this increase taking place in Asia and Africa. Commenting on the findings, Frederick Michelle, a healthy living advocate and lecturer at the Department of Psychology at Tanzania's University and Health and Allied Sciences, states that the built environment is now widely accepted as a factor that encourages healthy living as well as a health risk. Stresses and other challenges related to urban life still contribute to obesity among urban dwellers. In addition to sedentary lifestyles, motorized transportation, and office jobs that keep people sitting in one place for a long time. The researchers measured the risk of chronic diseases among women in Tanzania by using a marker of heart-related disease risk called C-reactive protein and body mass index was used to measure obesity. Researchers analyzed data on 2,212 women from the country's 2010 demographic and health survey with a focus on indicators of chronic diseases. Now, according to the study published in PLOS 1 this month, On November 3rd, about 27% of women living in cities had an increased risk of chronic disease compared with about 21% of women in rural communities. The proportion of urban women who were obese or overweight was 37% compared with 17.6% of the rural population. Of interest to policymakers will be um, our findings that urban women may be worse off on two indicators of chronic disease risk, suggesting further study and perhaps improve public health messaging, and health services in urban areas regarding how to reduce risk of cardiovascular disease and obesity. When we return, we'll finish up, so stay with me. (music) 
The Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendricks Foundation for Chronic Illness Awareness, giving hope and empowering those who suffer with chronic illness. See one, reach one, educate one to empower the masses. You can contact the foundation at 313. 313- Three zero three nine two one seven, or visit their website at https colon forward slash forward slash cemph foundation dot com. This is a five hundred one c three organization. No one should live. In lack, all contributions are tax deductible. Thank you for joining me back. You know, I have my great niece, I call her Miss Honey. Um, she has me on duo watching me. Um, do my podcast. That's why I said I want you guys to say hello to honey. You can go over to my TikTok. Follow me on my TikTok at Sulin4 and just say hello, honey. And then I'll know that you've been listening to my podcast. But if I have to say so myself, um, my great niece, honey, She is very intelligent. She is a beautiful spirit. And um, I'm just so proud of her and the things that she do and the things that she tries to learn to do. So let's get back to urban women have higher risk of chronic diseases than rural dwellers. Now, Chronic diseases such as asthma, diabetes, and cancer require long-term treatment. Pinchoff states that studying the impact of urban city on chronic diseases is a challenge in sub-Saharan Africa. Few nationally representative data sets are available on chronic disease in sub-Saharan Africa. The researchers state the demographic and health survey they analyzed had relevant heart disease data only for women and more importantly, even though it was only for women, And more importantly, more such research involving men in sub-Saharan Africa is urgently needed. So chronic disease is everywhere. And if you think that it just only runs rampant um, here in the States, You are mistaken. Um, You have to think about um, the culture over there in Africa and um, how it may not be that advanced within the medical field. So now, leave race out of kidney function estimates. Removing race modifier would yield more CKD diagnosis among black patients. And this article is brought to you by MedPage today. Now, removing racial adjustment on a common test of kidney function may help pick up more cases of chronic kidney disease, better known as CKD, 
and Black individuals, researchers reported. If you remember, I did a um, podcast not too long ago on how algorithms um, discriminate against Black patients who are in need of kidney transplants. Now, in a study of nearly 10,000 Black adults, removing racial adjustments from estimated um, glomular filtration rate from serum creatinine, better known as EGFR, CR increased the prevalence of CKD from 14.9% to 18.4%. And that was um, according to Harvard Medical School in Boston and colleagues. Additionally, existing CKD could be reclassified to a higher stage, they explained in a JAMA research letter, by removing racial adjustments, 29.1% of Black adults with diagnosed CKD may be upgraded to a higher, more severe disease stage, including a jump from 2.3% to 3.5% of Black adults being classified as stage 3B or higher. Also, the amount of patients classified as stage 4 CKD or higher would increase from 1% to 1.3%. Removal of racial adjustments would also play directly into care. The researchers argued, for example, about 20, 0.22% more Black adults would likely be referred to a specialist and about 0.14% more would now be covered for kidney disease education. About 0.5% more Black patients would also have medical nutrition therapy covered by Medicare following the removal of racial adjustments from EGFRCR. Now, it is truly sad to state that, and I've been saying this for a while now, racial discrimination is in everything from medicine to everything. We see it today more prevalent than we have ever before. Removing race from the equation would also increase the amount of patients eligible for a kidney transplant. This kitty backs to what I stated in the podcast about how algorithms play a big part in African-American patients not receiving kidney transplants. Adding about 0.051% new qualifying patients to the wait list. Also, the amount of Black patients on the donor wait list who were deemed unaccepted for a kidney transplant would also increase from 38.5% to 40.6%. 
The study comes after recent pushback from the National Kidney Foundation, better known as NKF, and the American Society of Nephrology, better known as ASN, which called for the reassessment of racial inclusion in the diagnosis of kidney disease. Now see, what does that tell you? I've known people who have lupus who are in need of a kidney, but they are on a wait list. And this puts a light bulb on in my brain that people how can I put this? People who are not of color gets a kidney transplant before people who are truly in need of one. It is all based on race in which it should not be. NKF and ASN formed a joint task force in August 2020 to specifically address this issue. In a joint statement, NKF and ASN asserted that unlike age, sex, and body weight, race is a social, not a biological construct, including adjustment for race in these EGFR equations ignores the substantial diversity within self-identified Black or African-American patients and other racial or ethnic minority groups. When we return, we'll finish up, so stay with me. Ophthalmology Associates, PC, Drs. Berman and Dr. Zuckerbrod, treating diseases of the eye and eye surgery. You can reach them at 313-341-3450. All right, and we're back. And we're going to finish up with keeping race out of... Kidney function estimates. Now, there was a separate statement that Man Ray noted that the remnants of race based medicine well into the 21st century expose a historical legacy of crude approaches to using identity in clinical practice. Further stated that we must find better ways to individualize care and removing race from clinical algorithms. See, there we go with the algorithms. is an important goal, but we must ensure that in doing so, we do not inadvertently harm the very individuals who we're trying to protect and care for. Now, Man Ray's group drew on 2001 through 2018 data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, computing EGFRCR from laboratory measures in non-Hispanic Blacks. They utilize the chronic kidney disease epidemiology collaboration, CKD, 
EPI equation, both with and without race coefficient. With a median age of 45, half of the group identified as women. The median EGFR was 102.9 ml with race but dropped to 88.8 ml after removal of race. In an accompanying editorial, Keith Norris, MD of the University of California, Los Angeles, and colleagues called these findings compelling and stated they raise a fundamental question. Who is being helped or possibly harmed by the race modifier? The editorialist went on to weigh the pros and cons of including race when estimating kidney function, explaining the benefit of catching CKD early in a traditionally underserved population paired with expansion of kidney disease education. Norse group highlighted the pitfall removing the race modifier, specifically the potential loss of eligibility for certain re non protective medications and less eligibility for live donor kidney transplants. They suggested that the substantial benefits that would come with removing this race modifier would likely outweigh and also minimize any harms that would come with it. So you see Algorithms and race plays a big part in medicine. Never think that it does not because it does. And you can go back to previous podcasts where I talked about race in medicine. We are all human. We should not. Well, let me put it this way. My care should not depend on the color of my skin. Now, there are those doctors who don't see the color of our skin and who take their Hippocratic oath seriously, like all doctors should, but they don't. But as you can see here, race and algorithms play a big part in medicine, and especially when it comes down to the diagnosis and treatments of kidney disease and who gets a kidney transplant. Please weigh in on this topic and let me know what your thoughts are. You can leave a voice message, a live voice message, And I will get it and will respond. Stay with me. All right, and we're back. And we're going to finish up with keeping race out of kidney function estimates. Now, There was a separate statement that Man Ray noted that the remnants of race-based medicine well into the 21st century expose a historical legacy of crude approaches to using identity in clinical practice. Further stated that we must find better ways to individualize care 
and removing race from clinical algorithms. See, there we go with the algorithms. Is an important goal, but we must ensure that in doing so, we do not inadvertently harm the very individuals who we're trying to protect and care for. Now, Man Ray's group drew on 2001 through 2018 data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, computing EGFRCR from laboratory measures in non-Hispanic Blacks. They utilize the chronic kidney disease epidemiology collaboration CKD EPI equation, both with and without race coefficient. With a median age of 45, half of the group identified as women. The median EGFR was 102.9 ml with race, but dropped to 88.8 ml after removal of race. In an accompanying editorial, Keith Norris, MD of the University of California, Los Angeles, and colleagues called these findings compelling and stated they raise a fundamental question. Who is being helped or possibly harmed by the race modifier? The editorialist went on to weigh the pros and cons of including race when estimating kidney function, explaining the benefit of catching CKD early in a traditionally underserved population paired with expansion of kidney disease education. Norse group highlighted the pitfall removing the race modifier, specifically the potential loss of eligibility for certain re non protective medications and less eligibility for live donor kidney transplants. They suggested that the substantial benefits that would come with removing this race modifier would likely outweigh and also minimize any harms that would come with it. So you see Algorithms and race plays a big part in medicine. Never think that it does not because it does. And you can go back to previous podcasts where I talked about race in medicine. We are all human. We should not. Well, let me put it this way. My care should not depend on the color of my skin. Now, there are those doctors who don't see the color of our skin and who take their Hippocratic oath seriously, like all doctors should, but they don't. But as you can see here, race and algorithms play a big part in medicine, and especially when it comes down to the diagnosis and treatments of kidney disease and who gets a kidney transplant. Please weigh in on this topic and let me know what your thoughts are. You can leave a voice message, a live voice message, And I will get it. 
and will respond. Stay with me. Well, it's that time for me. You know what time it is. It's time for me to go. I'm going to help my great niece, honey, with her phone work via Duo. That's right. I'm going to help her um, finish up her homework so she won't have a lot to do this weekend. Look, guys, during this time of the pandemic, do me a favor, but most importantly, do yourself a favor. Take some time out to just chill, relax, rejuvenate. And you know what I thought about when I said relax? If you watched A Different World with Whitley Gilbert, Jaleesa, Dwayne Wayne, um, and the Colonel, and the Colonel's son with Debbie Allen in it, And how Debbie Allen was the um, psychiatrist that Whitley went to see. The therapist, I should say. And Debbie Allen told him to relax, relate, release. So, that's what it reminded me of. So, do me one favor. Relax. What if, what what did I say now? Relax, relate, and release. Relax, relate, and re- re- oh, whatever it was. <laughs> it was kind of funny to me because I forgot what I said. But look, just take care of yourself. Come on, just take care of yourself during this time, and most importantly, stay safe. Stay safe and don't forget, look, we're going to have a Zoom, a live Zoom with um, author Sheila Smith, Life Lessons, coming up this month. So be ready for that. Um, It will be live on Facebook and I will try to um, put it on um, Periscope. It will be live, and uh, join us on that. And um, coming up later, um, about the middle of December, um, you go on over to my story, livingwithlupus.com, and visit the store. It will be some new items in there for you to purchase. Hey, and... All the sales from the items in the store benefit the Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendrix Foundation for Chronic Illness Awareness. That will assist us in providing medication for those who are suffering from lupus and any other chronic illness help put food on the table, help um, with just your daily living items. That's one way, um, you know, we are trying to generate funds for the foundation. Also, if you would like to donate to the foundation, go over to HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash C E M P H foundation dot com all your donations and gifts are tax deductible the foundation is a 501 C3 nonprofit so we are tax deductible well I've held you long enough, but I thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. Please 
remain safe, have a blessed, peaceful, and oh so prosperous weekend. May the blessings from the Almighty remain upon you and your family. I'm Susan Hendricks. I'll see you next week for another episode of my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. <laughs>